we can we can move to the third uh, uh, presentation that will be given by Mathieu Luzier from the Integrated System Laboratory from Zurich. And the title is Ab initio simulations of reRAMs from atoms to current versus voltage characteristics. This will be again a remote presentation, so uh, the stage is yours. Mm -hmm. So good afternoon, everybody. So can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, good, great. So then uh, yeah, I will talk about the simulation of conductive bridging random access uh, memories. So this is the outline of my presentation. I will short, start uh, with a short motivation about why we chose ab initio model to simulate those devices. And then I will present two applications to you. The first one that will be the transition from the high to the low resistance state of those devices. So how many atoms are involved in that process? Then I will present some experimental results that were obtained by a partner and that concern the influence of the oxide thickness of CBRAM cells on the current that they can carry before breaking down and how simulation can be used to explain that behavior. And finally, I will introduce two simulation approaches that we are currently pursuing in order to improve the quality of our simulations. So let me start here with that uh, motivation. So CBRAM cells, which are also called electrochemical metallization cells are very suitable if you want to use them as non-volatile memories here not in neuromorphic computing because they exhibit two clear states a high resistance state here at the bottom and a low resistance state here at the top so this is the result of 30 set reset cycles that were measured by our experimental partner at ETH at Zurich. So that's the group of Professor Jürg Leutold. So over the last uh, six, seven years, they have developed a technology to create structures as the one that you see here. So you have a copper electrode, a platinum electrode at the bottom, and those two electrodes here are separated by a silicon dioxide through which a copper filament can grow and can dissolve. Due to the, or because of the ultra scale dimensions of their devices, they were interested to know, so how many atoms do you need to move in the filament here in order to go from the high to the low resistance state and vice versa. So because we are doing uh, simulations, they asked us whether we could do that for them, which means that the first step that we had to do is to think about what kind of simulation method do we know to answer that question. So now if you look here, so because of the amorphous nature of that silicon oxide here, because of the difficulty to describe here metallic layers with tight binding model, here we also have ultra scale dimensions of the filament, and we have also the manifestation of strong quantum mechanical effects. So everything together convinced us that an ab initial quantum transport approach was necessary. So quantum transport, such that we can capture all quantum mechanical effects, such as tunneling and confinement, and ab initio in order to be able to describe all material layers that we have here without having any empirical parameters. So we therefore extended our in-house quantum transport simulator that is called OMEN, such that we could take any CBRAM geometry as input and that we could compute the current that flows through that as a function of the filament geometry, but also that we could would be able to simulate the distribution of the current here through that CBRAM, as well as if it's necessary, the temperature of each individual atom. So what we need to be able to do that is a simulation tool or a simulation models that align material science. So that would be the ab initio part and device engineering. So that's the quantum transport part. And of course, so if you want to be relevant to experiment, so you should be able to capture thousands of atoms and also to keep the simulation times as short as possible, what you can obtain with a massive parallelization of the workload. So that animation here shows you, for example, the current that flows to a metal insulator a metal structure where the two electrodes are connected here by a copper filament. 
And what you have now in blue, white, and red, so that's the current trajectories. And obviously, so they strongly depend on the geometry here of that filament that is modeled here with an atomistic resolution. So we can exactly see where the current flow through that device is. So now in terms of physics, so if you want to reach that kind of, res uh, that kind of results, so you cannot use a classical approach, as I already mentioned, not only are the quantum mechanical effects not included, but also band structure effects are missing. And most classical methods, so, or all classical methods, they are continuum, and we need to capture the atomistic granularity. So what is required is a direct solution of the Schrodinger equation, but not in that form. That is good if you have a closed boundary condition problem or periodic boundaries. boundaries. But here, we want to be able to inject electrons on one side of the device and to collect them on the other side, which requires the introduction of so-called open boundary conditions. Those OBCs, so they take the form of self energies here that are introduced into the Schrodinger equation together here with an injection vector. Now, depending on the type of transport that you want to simulate, so you can use either use what is called the quantum transmitting boundary method or the wave function formalism, as we like to call it. So it's a simple modification of the Schrodinger equation, which is ideal in case of ballistic transport. But if you want to include scattering, so you need to have a more advanced scheme, such as the non-equilibrium Green's function formalism. Now, regardless of the choice that you make, either you can compute a wave function or a Green's function. So in both cases, so what you obtain here, that's here the charge and the current densities that are solved self-consistently with Poisson's equation for each bias point of your device. So key ingredients of those equations, so that's the Hamiltonian matrix here, as well as the scattering self-energy. To simulate here our CBRAM cells, so we coupled our in-house quantum transport simulator OMEN with the CP2K DFT package that relies on a localized basis set, namely Gaussian type orbitals. So which means that we get from CP2K a Hamiltonian and an overlap matrix that can be directly passed here to our quantum transport simulator to compute the IV characteristics. So that's the two last steps of our simulation process. The first step is to create some kind of suitable CD-RAM cell structure, which typically can be done with molecular dynamics. And once we have that cell here, we can give it to CP2K to get the Hamiltonian and the overlap matrices. And then we move to the last step, which, is, which are the quantum transport simulations. So now let's apply here that simulation approach to the first case. So that's the transition from the high to the low resistance state here of the CBRAM cell that were fabricated by our partner and specifically how many atoms are involved in that process. In the simulation approach that I mentioned before, the first step is to create a CBRAM cell. So we always start with a crystalline silicon dioxide that we anneal at very high temperature before rapidly quenching it to 300 Kelvin. So that gives us here an amorphous silicon dioxide. We can then add a metallic contact on the left side, for example, of that oxide, and then here relax the interface between the two layers such uh, that we have a lower energy structure. So now comes the trick. So the next step would normally be here to simulate the growth of a metallic here nanofilament through the amorphous oxide. But this is something that is computationally very intensive and also hard to achieve. So there are some papers in the literature where they did that with classical molecular dynamics, but that looks rather like hero experiment and not necessarily something that you can do on a daily basis. So the trick that we applied here is we define a three-dimensional cone shape inside our amorphous oxide here, and then we replaced all silicon and oxygen atoms here by copper ones. And once this was done, so we relaxed the entire structure, the entire 
silicon dioxide matrix and copper filament here to make sure that the copper atoms occupy stable positions. So that's why we don't have a co perfect cone shape anymore. Last step here, that was to add the second metallic contact on the right hand side, such that we have a complete CBRAM cell. So typically our cells have an oxide thickness of three to four nanometer, a cross section of two by two square nanometer for a total of 4,000 to 5,000 atoms. So once we have the atomic structure here, we can apply a voltage on one side, ground the other side, and use our quantum transport approach to simulate the current that will flow through that. So for those simulations here, we restricted ourselves to the ballistic limit of transport and used the quantum transmitting boundary method. So that's the equation that you see here at the bottom. So what we need to do if we get the, uh, to get the current is to compute the transmission probability for electrons to go from one side to the other. And we want to do that at each possible electron energy, which means that we need to repeat the same operation several times. So since this, this can be very expensive, again, so we have to make a compromise in terms of the basis set. So for the Hamiltonian matrix, between physical accuracy and computational efficiency. So when you relax that structure, so you need to use a DZVP basis set in CP2K. But for transport calculations, that's too heavy. So we look for a combination that allows us to very well reproduce what the DZVP basis set gives. And we found that if we use SZV for the copper, atoms here and 3sp for the silicon and for the oxygen atoms so then we can pretty well reproduce the dzvp results so that's why we use that simplified basis set for all our transport calculations and kept dzvp for the structure generation so now what we did is we simulated with simulated different filament geometries, starting with a complete filament and then gradually removing atoms from the head of the filament to emulate the, the process of dissolving the copper filament when a negative voltage is applied to the structure. The results are shown here at the bottom. So the horizontal axis, so that's the gap length here. And the vertical axis, that's the quantum conductance that we can extract from our electrical current. So they are given, those values are given in the unit of the conductance quantum. And at the top, so the horizontal axis, it's the number of atoms that were removed and that correspond here to the gap length that was created. So first thing here is that before we started removing atoms, so in the low, in the low resistance state, so we have a conductance of 0.32 G0. So this is very close to what was measured experimentally. Experimentally, they had 0.3 G0. So which gives us some confidence that what we are doing is not completely outside of the picture. Next thing that is important and that is maybe striking is the fact that when we increase that gap, the current does not decrease monolithically, but in a step-like fashion. And we have some intermediate steps here in between the low and the high resistance state. And if we carefully look here at the experimental results, we also have those intermediate steps. So that's the same qualitative behavior as what we have also obtained in our simulation. And finally, so what we found out here is that once we remove about 20 atoms from the head of the filament, so 20 copper atoms that were dissolved. So we end up with a high resistance state of 4 times 10 to the minus 7 G0, which roughly corresponds also to what was measured experimentally. So in summary, so we have both kind of qualitative agreement in terms of the conductance values and a qualitative agreement in terms of the behavior of the current. So what remains to do is to explain what happens here, what creates that step-like behavior. And to do that, so we considered the current trajectories through our 
copper filament. So that's the same as what I showed you before as an animation. The difference is that now here, so we have a projection on a 2D grid. So blue here, it's relatively low current density and red, that's a high current density. And what you can notice here in that plot is that some of the atoms that we have here at the head of the filament, they are avoided here by the electrons. So like here, so we see that electrons, they go around that atom, which may indicate that that atom here was oxidized by the surrounding oxygen atoms, or that we might have here a silicon cluster through which here electrons prefer to go through. So the same happens here, for example, for that fourth atom that is completely ignored here by electrons. And if we look back here at our current behavior, what do we observe? So if we remove here that first atom, so the current magnitude does not change at all. The reason being that that atom is not used to breach the two electrodes of our structure. And the same happens here if we remove the fourth atom. So removing it does not change the current value. But once we remove the next atom, so then we create here a bridge. Or we remove a bridge between those atoms here, which means that we induce a tunneling effect. And electrons have to tunnel to go from one atom to, uh, to the other, which explains so why we have that step-like behavior. So this means, in summary, that that step-like behavior does not seem to be a pure quantum mechanical effect. It's rather caused by the geometry of the filament that might contain some atoms that have less importance than the others. And when you start dissolving your filament by applying a negative voltage, so that's the first atoms that would disappear. So that means you have your dissolution process. Some atoms are removed but the current remains the same. So that's at least the answer that we provided to our experimental partner. So soon after, they, they came back to us with a second question that was no more, that was no more about that first generation of devices, but about a second generation that they fabricated afterwards and where they replaced copper by a silver here layer. So silver can also be easily oxidized and reduced. So it also works very well to create CD-RAM cell. And in that second generation of devices, what they, they did is here to scale the oxide thickness between the platinum and the silver electrodes. And then they try to push the current to the maximum value they can before the device breaks down. And what is reported here in that graph is the current that they could measure before the device breaks down. And that current, surprisingly to them at least, was much bigger when the oxide here was thinner. So we have here a current of about 100 microampere when the oxide thickness is just one nanometer, while the current is about one Na a microampere when the oxide is equal to three nanometer. And here again, they asked us whether we could explain so what happens in their device. And since we have a failure mechanism that is involved, and that failure is very often connected to heat or to self-heating or to hover heating, so our first step was again to adapt our simulation approach such that we could also account for thermal transport. In other words, we also had to solve a system of Green's functions, not only for electrons, bore, but for phonons. So the difference is that the Green's functions have a different names. They are called D instead of G here. The self energies are pi instead of sigma. And we need as input a dynamical matrix instead of a Hamiltonian matrix. And that dynamical matrix can be computed for example, with density functional perturbation theory or with DFT by moving each individual atoms and then computing the forces that act on them. And that's the approach that we selected. So if you just consider thermal transport, so you will not have any heat heating effect. 
So what is also absolutely necessary is to self-consistently couple the electron and the phonon population, which occurs here through two scattering self-energies, sigma for electrons and pi for phonons. So through sigma, electrons can emit and can absorb phonons, and through pi, those phonons locally modify the phonon population. So we can have additional phonons that, that are created, or we can take them away. So for those of you who are familiar with that approach, so here are the, the forms of the two scattering self-energies that we used. So we have here for electrons, a self-energy that depends on the product of the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the atomic positions, an electron Green's function and a phonon Green's function. Why the pi matrix here is the product of two electron Green's functions. So that's how the self consistency, self -consistency between both populations here come into play. So then again, so we had to create some structures. So here we selected three different thicknesses, 3.5, 2.4, and 1.6 nanometer. So we use the same anneal and quenching method as before, but to be able to reliably compare those three structures and not to introduce effects that would come from the geometry here, so what we did is we started from the longest structure and truncated here the bottom. So that's the part where we have a lot of copper, uh, of copper or silver atoms in the present case. And then we relaxed again here, everything close to that contact. And that's how we created those structures, making sure that the head of the filament remains the same in all cases. So first step, then we computed the IV characteristics of that device from 0 to 0 0.2 volt as a function here of the oxide thickness. So blue is 1.6, black is 2.4, and red is 3.5 nanometer. So if we just look at the currents here, so they are pretty much the same. And that's also what we obtain if we extract the corresponding conductance. So the conductance vary here by about 10%. So there is not much difference when we just look at the electrical properties. And that can be again explained by the electronic trajectories, including now electron phonon scattering. So at the bottom, so that's the part that we truncated. So you can see that the electron distribution is very homogeneous, such that cutting away part of that, it's not going to limit the current that can flow through the, the filament. The limitation is coming here from the head of the filament, where we just have a couple of atoms that are connected to each other. So more interesting is what happens if we look at the temperature inside those devices. So since we compute the phonon population, so we can convert that phonon population into some kind of effective temperature. And then we can average the temperature over the cross section of our device, extract the maximum value of the temperature, of the average temperature, and report it as a function of the current that flows through the structure. So that's the horizontal axis here. That's how much current we have. And here it's a temperature increase with respect to room temperature. And now we have large differences. So the blue curve is still the 1.6 nanometer. And we see that the temperature increases with the square of the current. But the increase here, it's much slower when we have a very thin oxide, while we have here a steeper increase if we have here a longer oxide. So just before I explain so the consequence of that behavior, let me just show you here the temperature of each individual atoms. So that's the points that we have here inside the device that has an oxide thickness of 1.6 nanometer and 3.5 nanometer. So we go along the transport axis of the device and then extract the temperature of each individual atom. So that's the map that we have here at the bottom. So for each atom, so we can compute an effective temperature. And then we reported it as a function of the transport direction, which goes from one electrode to the other. Once we have those points, so we average their temperature over the cross section here. That's the vertical axis and the out of plane axis here of that map. And we obtain then the blue 
and the red curve. And what is reported here on the left is in fact here the maximum of the blue or of the red curve as a function of the current that flows through the device. That means as a function of the voltage. And of course, so that average temperature does not say much about the highest temperature that we can get for some atoms. So you see the highest temperature can be almost 50 Kelvin higher than the average. Now, the last step here is to connect those results to the experimental finding that the longer the oxide is, the less current that device can carry before it breaks down. So if we now assume that once the internal temperature, the average internal temperature reaches a certain threshold value, then the oxide is going to break down and then the entire device is going to break down. So we see directly so why that has why longer ox, longer oxide are bad or are not as good as thinner one. Let's assume for simplicity that if we have a 40 Kelvin temperature increase, the device is going to break down. So if we now draw a line here from those 40 Kelvin, so we see that those 40 Kelvin, they are reached at just three micro ampere here for the longer oxide, while they would probably be reached at five micro ampere for the, uh, the 2.4 nanometer device. And if we extrapolate here the curve for the 1.6 nanometer, so that would probably be here at 20, 10, or 15, or 20 micro ampere, which means that the longer the oxide, the earlier we will reach a certain temperature, and the earlier our device will break down. And this also makes sense. So the longer the oxide, the higher is the probability that an electron will emit phonons and that it will locally increase the temperature of our devices. So finally, in the remaining of that presentation, so I would like to talk about two extensions of, the sim of our simulation approach that we are currently working on. The reason might be obvious. So if you have carefully followed my presentation, so something that you haven't seen, so that's an IV curve of the device that also includes the hysteresis that you normally have in those devices. So when you go up to a high current and you go down, so you follow two different paths. And the reason for that I already mentioned is that if you use molecular dynamics, so you will have troubles simulating the growth and the dissolution of the filament. So then we decided to go along two parallel directions. And the first one is maybe the simpler one, but also the one that might work the best is to use a finite element. So we developed a finite element model of CB RAM cells. So inspired by the work that uh, Professor Yelmini did already many years ago. So those models, they typically involve drift and diffusion processes for the ions. They also involve re reduction and oxidation reactions. The temperature can be modeled with Fourier's law. And then we also have an electrostatic potential that must be solved self-consistently with the rest. All those equations, they require parameters that can be found in the literature for some materials. They can be computed with DFT, or they uh, can be used as fitting parameters. But if you want to be predictive, so you would like to be able to have those parameters before you do the measurement, so you cannot use them here as fitting parameters. So what we decided to do is to use our ab initio quantum transport approach to compute those parameters. So one of them is, for example, the tunneling current that you have between the head of the filament and the counter electrode. And what I showed you so far, so the approach of Omen and CP2K that I showed you before, it's ideal to get that current here. And since we already had a lot of atomic structures, we could also use them to compute here the diffusion constants of the silver or of the copper ions. We are also now in the process of computing the generation barrier and the recombination barriers of those ions, and also 
to add the calculation of the thermal conductivities such that we can also include joule heating. And everything should be done at the ab initial level, which then allows us to reproduce experimental data relatively well, as is shown here in the center of that figure. So parallel to that, we have also started implementing, implementing a kinetic Monte Carlo simulator and to combine it with density functional theory and with quantum transport calculation. So now the difference is that we, the difference with the previous approach is that we did not apply it to CD-RAM cell, but to valence change memories through which the filament is made of oxygen vacancies and no more of cations. But in principle, that does not change anything. So what we have to do is all the time use density functional theory to compute the parameters that enter the KMC model. And those parameters are here, the activation energy for the oxygen vacancies, the formation energy, the recombination energy, as well as the atom frequency. With, with those parameters, so we can then simulate the growth of the filament here through an hafnium dioxide layer, for example. And what we do is we do not use simple points in a grid. So we really start from an atomistic oxide that was created from DFT. And then in that atomistic oxide that we have created, so we can add and remove or we can generate and recombine oxygen vacancies. So once we have a structure, we can add titanium nitride contact on both, both sides of it, and then we can use Omen to compute the resulting current. So the next slide here shows you some preliminary results. So starting from the set process here that contains 256 here. Oxygen vacancies, we abruptly move to the reset volt to the reset state here by applying a voltage of minus two volt. Stay there for a few seconds till we could decrease here the number of oxygen vacancies to just nine in different steps. And at each step here, we computed the electron transmission function through the structures here by adding titanium nitride. And as we expect here, the transmission function keeps decreasing when we remove oxygen vacancies. So when we dissolve the filament and here in the end, we have a transmission function that is much lower than in the set case. And if we evaluate the corresponding current, so we have a decrease of the current by several orders of magnitude. And we believe that by using such an approach, so we will be able to really simulate the entire set reset cycle and that we would be able to do that multiple times. So that's what we are currently working on. And that's, I think, a promising approach to be able to combine DFT and quantum transport with realistic device structures. And this makes me come to my conclusion. So I presented to you an ab initio quantum transport approach that works for CD-RAM cells, but also for OX-RAM cells. So I presented the physical models, illustrated them with two different applications. And now what we are doing is to continue working with our experimental partners on the optimization of their devices. And we are also moving from binary to analog devices, also for neuromorphic computing applications. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll open for questions. So if any one of you has uh, some question. You are behind the light. Thank you. It's uh, Stefano Brivio speaking from CNR. Um, <laughs> maybe you told, uh, you, you mentioned this, but uh, maybe I missed. Uh, for the case of uh, uh, the first devices in the high resistance state, you have dispersed atoms uh, in the filament. Uh, I'm wondering whether you check the stability of the filament or this filament of this configuration as a function of the temperature, for example, because for instance, Daniele mentioned that uh, in, in uh, silver-based devices, 
the filaments collapse into cluster of silver atoms with spherical shape. So I was wondering whether this can be checked in your simulation as well. Yes, so um, we did not check for that, uh, that specific structure. We created, so we did not create one single structure. So we created several uh, structures to also have some statistics. So this is definitively something that can be done because once we have created that, uh, that filament, we could again anneal it at a higher temperature and see how the, uh, the ions diffuse. So now in a different, uh, experiment, uh, in a different um, context, so we have experienced that in fact, um, heat is gonna make the, the ions or the oxygen vacancies diffuse and it's gonna change the properties of the filament. And that in a sense, and it's a well-known effect that you can use heat to transform a binary device into uh, an analog devices or at least a device that is better analog. So of course, yes, so if we increase the temperature, like when you have a self-heating or dual heating effects, so the current that emits phonons and that increase the temperature. So if we would like to be accurate, so we should give the temperature profile that we compute and the atomic structure to molecular dynamics, we should get a new filament uh, structure and then we should recompute the current and we should go back and forth between molecular dynamics and quantum transport till we get a stable structure. So that's a very good point, yes. Thanks. So I have... Uh, okay. So Pablo de Hon from ICN2. I have a question about your um, scheme to compute the transport. So from the scheme mm -hmm. that you show from geometry to Hamiltonian to transport, I understand that you compute the Hamiltonian at zero voltage between the, the electrodes, right? That's so, correct. Uh, so my question is, aren't you missing things like... Uh, Trap charging and discharging and things that can be dependent of the of the voltage as you apply. So the voltage is reapplied then when we do the quantum transport calculation, and then we can recompute of uh, an electrostatic potential that comes on top of the one that we had from DFT, and that was for the equilibrium case. So we can, in a sense, account for for those effects, but at a later stage. And it's true that by doing that, we might be um, missing uh, missing some effects uh, like uh, so when you do uh, the uh, when you you do the pure DFT calculation so that could um, modify locally so the entries of your Hamiltonian matrix which we do not capture in our case since we freeze the Hamiltonian after the DFT calculation but we can still have uh, the the electrostatic potential so the solution of Poisson's equation but not how that might affect some of the entries of your Hamiltonian. I don't know if uh, the mic is on. Uh, I guess it would be just a matter of, uh, of making an extra loop, right? If you want to include these effects, there is nothing basic uh, that uh, precludes you from, from doing that, right? No, no, uh, theoretically. Theoretically, it's, it's doable. Practically, that can be sometimes uh, dif difficult since uh, applying a voltage in, in directly in DFT, it's... Uh, not something uh, straightforward since you break the periodicity of your simulation domain and then you need to have uh, some uh, uh, s like the berry phase approximation for example like what is used for ferroelectrics such that you can still uh, do your, your calculation while breaking the periodicity in quantum transport calculation it's something that is natural no but i mean we there, there are many methods and many codes that already do that uh, for, for instance transiesta we wrote it uh, 20 years ago and mm -hmm. it is doing that so uh, you compute the green function oh, yeah, yeah. with, so, with, yeah. with a final voltage and then you compute the density from the green function and you feed it back to the hamiltonian calculation so yeah so sorry so i i'm i missed uh, i missed your point yeah yeah that's true so that's something we did with the the cp2k uh, the cp2k developers so we had that possibility that uh, you do a DFT calculation, uh, you do start, you create a Hamiltonian, an initial guess for the Hamiltonian with CP2K. So then you uh, use it in Omen to calculate uh, your uh, charge density, your non equilibrium charge density. And then uh, you can feed it back to, uh, to CP2K so that, such that uh, CP2K will uh, recreate the new Hamiltonian and you go back and forth till you get uh, convergence. The problem is that uh, for the kind of um, 
for the size of the structures that we want to do that. So that was extremely slow and we had troubles getting, uh, getting convergence. So it was difficult to, to make those two tools uh, compatible. But yeah, that's true that that exists. It's just that uh, if you go to structures with 5,000 atoms or more, so that can be really expensive. Thanks. Any other questions? If not, uh, let's, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.